the class. Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to our uh, short uh, Jupiter meets the Earth uh, EarthCube workshop. Um, we first would like to thank uh, uh, EarthCube uh, organizers, in particular uh, Lynn Schreiber, who's been extremely helpful in um, getting us uh, getting us uh, um, all set up. Um, and I also want to thank uh, thank the team, in particular uh, Lindsay Hagee, who's done a huge amount of work on the logistics and the material um, to to have a, a successful uh, workshop. Um, we're going to try to give you a bit of an overview of uh, what uh, the project from this team has done, and uh, and hopefully we'll have a chance to to talk to you folks afterwards. So a little bit of uh, the usual Zoom etiquette that by now probably everyone uh, is used to. Um, please uh, stay muted unless you're speaking, so we don't get too much background noise. And remember that we are recording, so that if you would rather not be on camera, uh, you can leave your camera off. Um, and uh, the link right there is a Slack channel that you should all have been invited to. But if for some reason you didn't, you can. Go to that, uh, go to that URL and uh, uh, join the Slack channel where uh, you can post. We can post uh, dis uh, discussion questions um, throughout uh, throughout the workshop, and uh, we'll uh, do our best to monitor that channel and to respond to those in the in the extended Q and A session that we have uh, later on. So, for those of you who haven't used Slack too much, um, this is what it will look like if you use the web client. Uh, many of you probably do use Slack, but in case you haven't, um, you will um, have. Uh, the, the channel that we are using is called Jupiter Meets the Earth. Uh, you'll see that on the left. Um, you type your chat messages at the bottom and, uh, and the, uh, excuse me, let me change the size of this window just a little bit so that those Google slide controls don't cover the actual speaking area. Um, and, uh, and if you click on the, on the little pin, uh, push pin icon, um, you will see uh, useful, useful links and resources that get posted uh, that will appear on the right hand side. So let's let us tell you a little bit about what uh, what this project sort of is, is driven by the motivation for this project. Um, and in this we're taking uh, very, very strong cues from Joe Hammond and Ryan Abernathy and others in the Pangeo project who kind of framed uh, used this framing for their design of the Pangeo project. And it's something that we find a particularly valuable way to look at the problem is to think about what drives progress in, in general in the sciences, but specific, some of this is somewhat specific to the geosciences. Um, and the geosciences in principle ought to be a, a virtuous feedback cycle between the development of theoretical ideas and models. In many areas, we do have ODEs and PDEs that we consider to be uh, kind of fun, the fundamental physical uh, driving mechanisms of geophysical processes, atmospheric processes, uh, fluid processes, geological processes. Um, and these are described by fundamentally mathematical models. Uh, we know they're imperfect and they are approximate and they leave, in, uh, they leave uh, processes out, um, but they still form sort of one of the, the cornerstones of our description of the natural world. Um, we combine those with observations and data um, that, uh, that feeds into them. And obviously we try to model, um, to um, incarnate those models via simulations and computational techniques um, that are becoming increasingly sophisticated. Um, the volumes of data that we have are larger and larger. The models are, uh, are increasingly complex. Uh, they are, uh, Today, there are multi-scale models. They, we pay much more attention to nonlinear terms. Uh, we incorporate uh, noisy stochastic terms. Um, the size of the observations and the data is becoming absolutely astronomical for, uh, uh, for uh, not, nobody here that should, uh, that should be news. Uh, as a quick example, the, the data set for the CMIP-6 um, uh, climate model into comparison project uh, in its current iteration is estimated to be on the order of 15 to 30 petabytes. That is a lot of data and virtually every, anyone who's dealing with experimental data uh, today um, is, is dealing with uh, rates of on the order of terabytes a day. Um, and data that is very complex as well. It's not just a single sensor anymore. You typically need to integrate data from multiple of multiple kinds. And to make sense of all of that, you need uh, today very complex um, computational machinery. Um, we're talking about um, exascale computing at the, at the national labs and uh, all of the HPC centers in the world. Um, a lot of folks are doing their work in the cloud, but that requires its own set of software engineering skills and DevOps skills of all kinds. And, uh, and today machine learning is widely used. That's its own basically industry with its own um, engineering, um, engineering complexities. And so this virtuous cycle is one that is sort of gummed up as, as uh, Joe and Ryan um, and others uh, framed it in, the, in their Pangeo discussions, the gears of the engine are kind of starting to grind. Um, and part of this is basically complexity, right? There is a huge amount of 
um, complexity in integrating all of this. Uh, we're well past the stage where um, a single scientist could um, understand the theory, um, the physical models, um, gather, uh, gather or get access to some data and run their own codes um, on their workstation uh, with a little bit of Fortran that they wrote on their own. This might have worked in the 70s or even in the 90s. It's completely infeasible today um, because uh, so the, our, our framing is how do we get these gears more effectively turning again? If we want to focus on geosciences questions, we need to bring to the table together effectively teams. Uh, it's not going to, going to be possible to do this as an individual who have expertise in the domain, um, expertise in data science and statistical methods and analysis questions in the protocols of, of good statistical data analysis. Um, data management is its own, has become effectively its own uh, complex discipline, data engineering. Um, and there's a huge amount of software engineering uh, that comes into play. Um, there's a huge amount of there's a huge amount of building tools. Um, and the Jupiter Meets the Earth project is uh, a little bit of basically trying to join the software engineering aspect as a, as a first class partner to this world. It was, uh, it was funded by the NSF through a grant proposal um, that we wrote together uh, with uh, the, our co-PIs on the team here. Um, uh, Kevin Paul, Joe Hammond, uh, Laura Larson, um, Lindsay Hagee, um, and, uh, uh, and myself uh, wrote, uh, wrote this grant. It was funded by the EarthCube program. Um, and uh, the idea was to argue that it would be uh, a, a real partnership between the software engineering and the domain sciences. A lot of projects, at the, uh, at the federal funding agencies have typically uh, been done and we were all probably familiar with that pattern where there's either a very strong focus on cyber infrastructure and computer science research. Um, and there's a little bit of perhaps, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I can be slightly provocative, uh, lip service paid to the notion that, uh, that, the, that uh, the computer science research will engage with the domain, uh, with uh, some domain topics. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we also know of a lot of projects that are funded purely on a domain, um, on a domain emphasis uh, question, and where there's sort of a wink, wink, nod, nod, uh, somebody somehow will write the software. Um, and instead um, of either of those uh, approaches that we feel are perhaps a little bit imbalanced, uh, we chose to have a, a real partnership between the, uh, the open source software tools that we're building and the domain scientists. Um, and this comes a lot from our experience experiences in, um, at least for myself, um, in how we've built uh, Project Jupiter. Project Jupiter is, an, a, is a long running open source software project. Um, but what I want to emphasize for a moment is that this project um, at this point is much more than software. Um, yes, there is a focus on code. And when people think about open source software, the word obviously is software. Um, importantly, software that should be extensible and reusable by others. Um, but on a, for a project to have a large impact in a, in a community and for a project to really um, uh, live uh, beyond, uh, beyond the, the, uh, the, uh, the original intent of, of perhaps its first authors, it actually needs to consider um, a layered, a layered set of questions that go that go far beyond software, um, and uh, and these layers in a in a not to kind of the, the classic Maslow hierarchy um, that we have here include services and content that are presented uh, with the software. Um, they include potentially standards and protocols and ways to interoperate and build an ecosystem, and they include a human community that needs to be managed. And so I want to spend just a couple of minutes uh, kind of highlighting some of these points uh, from the perspective of Project Jupiter. Um, some of you may know Jupiter and or IPython, its predecessor project, which began um, its life as basically a simple interactive environment for experimenting with Python code in data analysis and scientific computing workflows. Um, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, originally named IPython Notebook, uh, which many uh, of you have probably used, um, is an environment that, uh, that allows you to combine um, text, uh, code, and the results of the code execution accessible through a web browser. But what really has brought um, uh, Jupyter to a very large scientific community is actually the fact that we provide, on top of this software that you can download, the project actually provides content and services that people use. Um, Binder is an example of a service that allows you to turn any Git repository 
with one click into a collection, if it's properly prepared, um, into a collection of live interactive notebooks. Um, NB Viewer is a way um, that uh, allow, is a tool that allows you to take a notebook that is publicly available and provide a web view of it to share with others, say a colleague who doesn't have these tools installs, installed or on social media or as part of a, uh, uh, as part of a website. Jupyter Hub allows you to put all of these tools on the on through a web browser accessible uh, on shared infrastructure, whether it's a supercomputing center, a research cluster, uh, or a cloud computing environment. The point is that it, these are not things that you download. These are things that you can actually where you can actually run services, and many of these you can access for free. And they have created um, a far larger impact from the original software that we had that we had written um, than than actually even we had uh, we had imagined at the beginning because we realized that it was really the entry point for many people is actually the content, is what they want to read, is what they want to access, is what they want to share with others, rather than being focused on the tools themselves, as perhaps sometimes the, the tool makers tend to, uh, tend to think. Um, and below the software, um, if, if we think that, uh, um, that the software sits on core ideas, in the case of Jupyter, um, those ideas are fundamentally a computing protocol to do this kind of interactive work, yes, in Python, and that's what most of us use in our day-to-day -day research, but also in languages like Julia, um, in languages like R, and ultimately in any virtually any programming language. And today there are implementations of the Jupyter, what is called the Jupyter protocol in over a hundred different programming languages, including things like C++. Um, so my point with this is to emphasize that in Jupyter, we took the time to not only write the software, but to actually take a step back and ask the question, what is this software doing? And what of this can we abstract and formalize into a standard that others can um, that others can use for their own purposes, even even if they don't use Python, which is our tool of choice. And ma making the time and taking the effort to engage with other communities to create that standard has been enormously valuable um, because now uh, there's a much greater interoperability across programming languages, regardless um, uh, of uh, of which one uh, which one you're using, and you can share content and tools back and forth across uh, language communities. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, uh, at the bottom of, uh, of all of these tools are humans. Um, and it's very important to, if you, if you think of the role of open source software in science, to think about these issues. Um, Jupyter is a project where we've taken a lot of time and we're currently undergoing and trying to finalize our restructuring of our governance. Um, but it is a project that even though it began originally, IPython was me procrastinating on a PhD at CU Boulder. Um, today, it's a huge project with many, many contributors. Um, and we have a formalized governance model that includes uh, a body called the, the Steering Council. We have a formal process for institutional partners. Um, there is a 501c3 called NumFocus that provides fiscal sponsorship the project. This takes an enormous amount of time. It's not recognized as real work in academic settings for the most part. And yet it is critical to maintain a healthy community that can grow, that can engage with different stakeholders, that can grow more diverse, um, that can engage different use cases. Um, it's, it's effort that we're not trained for well, that we're typically not recognized for, but that is, it's critical to understand that this is necessary in the construction of a, of a high impact, long lived um, scientific computing project uh, that, is, that is based around open source software. Um, and yes, we do build tools. We do build software. Um, Jupyter Lab is one tool that has uh, that has been at the forefront of, of the research um, in uh, in in Jupyter over the last few years. And we want to I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, flagging uh, its extensibility because that is part of what we want to engage this community about. Which is that Jupyter Lab is basically an evolution of the Jupyter Notebook interface to go well beyond notebooks. Um, to consider, for example, the fact that data should be a first class citizen. This is an example of the Jupyter Lab interface not viewing a notebook, but rather viewing different data files, an image file, a CSV file. And importantly, the extensibility means that let's say we have a JSON file here, but that encodes actually geospatial data, in this case, the locations of uh, museums in Washington, DC. Um, and this file is actually uh, honors the GeoJSON schema. Then this file can be visualized with a plugin as an actual live moving map using leaflet. So the point is, in Jupyter Lab, the community can write uh, its own plugins that access data uh, as a first class citizen 
in, in the way that is most appropriate to that particular data format or that data modality. Um, this kind of extensibility has been uh, really taken very successfully advantage of uh, um, by this community of uh, neuroscientists at Columbia University um, in the group led by Oral Lazar. And I wanna show this extremely short video. Um, let's see if this works. Where you will see the Jupyter Lab interface that has a notebook um, on the left, but that also has a WebGL 3D uh, th uh, 3D view of uh, of the fruit fly brain. Um, neuronal circuits in the fruit fly are simulated as electrical circuits, and those are viewed on the right uh, on the lower right hand panel. Those circuit simulations are run on the GPU cluster. Um, um, uh, genomics data about the fruit fly is accessible from a custom database and is visible on this panel on the right. This is still the same Jupyter Lab that you installed. You can see the notebook right in the middle. But that team built a custom interface that added their own plugins and their own tools to, to effectively turn, uh, turn the default generic scientific JupyterLab interface into a custom interface for, uh, for the study of the data that is most relevant to them. And we want to use this as a motivation to inspire all of you. We're, we're building some of these things for our own use cases, and we want all of you to think of this as a tool that you can extend and mold to your own scientific needs. Uh, Pangeo, I'm realizing that I'm already running late, so I'm going to uh, finish rather quickly. Uh, Pangeo, uh, which is the other leg of this project, this project is a collaboration between the Jupyter team and the Pangeo team, um, is uh, the union of Jupyter for interactive computing with the DASC high-level system for distributed computing, um, along with the X-Array um, numerical array uh, project that basically takes something like the, the, uh, the traditional NumPy arrays and blends them with the NetCDF data model um, to build a platform so that scientists can use interactively um, um, these tools to do very large scale data analysis. This is a quick example from a blog post by Scott Henderson where a scientist zooms into a small data set, what looks like a, like a figure, and as some little color bars wiggle at the bottom, the image zooms. That seems like not a big deal, but what's happening is that zooming requires running over 100 gigabytes of Landsat data in the state of Washington and running a big distributed computing cluster. By doing this on Pangeo, the scientists can just log in with a browser and do the zooming, and Pangeo will orchestrate that cluster, will schedule the jobs automatically to make that happen um, and for and for uh, the scientists to be able to focus on on their uh, data exploration rather than effectively becoming an Amazon or a Google software cloud software engineer. Um, so Pangeo is a project that by joining uh, by joining these tools tries to make the idea of having um, interactive data analysis done in the cloud with data that is ready uh, that is ready for analysis um, a reality. Uh, we've left two links in here to two talks by Ryan Abernathy and Joe Hammond uh, that tell you a lot more about Pangeo. We could spend we could spend the whole day uh, talking only about Pangeo and the impact it has had um, and. Uh, and Joe will talk a little bit more uh, later about how you can get involved with Pangeo. So in this project, as I said earlier, uh, our, our perspective is to join research use cases um, in four specific areas and uh, uh, climate data analysis, specifically the CMEP6 data, cryosphere science, hydrology and geophysics, um, to drive developments in the Pangeo and Jupiter ecosystems, especially, especially around interactivity, data discovery, um, and infrastructure, both in the cloud and HPC. And this is the team, um, the team of scientists and, and developers who are working on the project. Um, and uh, so today, what we hope to do is get you, give you a little bit of an overview of these projects um, and present avenues for uh, all of you to get involved, as well as having time to discuss with you on Slack uh, in the Q&A session um, and hopefully to remain engaged uh, so that we understand your needs and questions better so that we get better ideas from all of you for this project to be as impactful as possible with these four areas being only only what, were, uh, what was the scientific focus of our team, but our intent being much broader, uh, much broader impact. So I'm already uh, five minutes late, um, but uh, we do have a little bit of slack. I'm gonna try to end quickly. We're going to continue with Scott Henderson's uh, overview of Pangeo, uh, then a talk by Kevin Paul. Uh, we'll have a short break uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at 8.30, and then we'll have a sequence of lightning, of five minute lightning talks, and we'll conclude uh, with a longer session of community Q&A. We're probably gonna lose a few minutes into that, but, but we, we knew that would be the case. So just to remind those of you who may have come in uh, a little bit later, if you're not on Slack, this is the URL for you to join the conversation, to ask us questions, et cetera. And uh, I will stop here and we will continue with Scott Henderson right away. I will stop my sharing so that Scott can, can hop on.
All right. Um, just a second, everyone. All right. Good morning, everyone. Can people see my screen now? Yes, looks good. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to jump right into it to um, keep us on schedule. I'm Scott Henderson. I'm a research scientist at the University of Washington. Um, I work at the eScience Institute, and I also work in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences. So in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try and give you a bit more detail um, jumping off of what Fernando mentioned about the Pangeo project, which I've been involved in for the last year or so. So um, if you're new to Pangeo, I highly recommend going to the website, uh, pangeo.io. This screenshot is taken just from the website and you'll see straight off the bat that Pangeo is a community platform for big data and geoscience. Um, and if you read further down, the first statement um, I've copied verbatim here, um, is that Pangeo is first and foremost a community promoting open, reproducible, and scalable science. So I really like that uh, Maslow diagram that Fernando showed where community was at the bottom, kind of the foundational aspects to all other work happening in this project. And um, there are a lot of venues, which we'll talk about later this afternoon for getting involved in this community, but I've just pointed some arrows here to various like online forums that are really central to bringing together scientists and software developers um, as part of this community effort. So Pangeo got started around early 2017 from EarthCube funding um, and since then has grown to involve a lot of other funding sources um, and bringing in scientists and software engineers from a bunch of different institutions. I got started uh, working with this community as a result of a NASA grant uh, that's focused on developing capabilities for analyzing Earth observation data from NASA, which is starting to move to AWS um, for hosting. <clears throat> and why is this effort happening now? Um, as already stated, there's this need with growing archives um, and technologies for better scalable tools for doing scientific computing with large data sets. So, for the case of NASA, you can see this plot in the lower left where um, we're just looking at the archive growth of NASA over the years. And there's a pretty big step change in archive size due to some new satellites that are launching in the near future here. One of them being NISAR um, that's slated now postponed a bit, but for 2021. And then on the right, you're seeing a size of CMIP global climate model outputs. Um, <clears throat> so these data sets are becoming cumbersome to work with and the agencies hosting those data sets are also starting to indicate uh, the need to host these data sets on central servers, potentially cloud providers um, for improved access. So this move, um, I'm going to focus on the NASA case for a minute here, uh, to a cloud server is a big deal because it changes a lot of the typical workflow we're accustomed to in um, doing scientific computing. So um, this schematic on the lower left is just a redrawing of the schematic we saw from Fernando, um, <clears throat> where we're illustrating kind of the envisioned architecture that um, this big data platform, the platform aspect or computing aspect of Pangeo is advocating for. And this platform is really uh, <clears throat> kind of centered by a Jupyter Hub system. So a server running in the same data center where large data uh, sets are stored. So in this case, we've got a cloud here. Um, this could also be an HPC system, but the idea is to start allowing people um, interactive access to these large data sets without having to download those data sets to their local computers. So we instead move algorithms to the data uh, this will improve the current state of the art. And on the right here, I've just listed a few kind of key aspects to this style of computing, some benefits where we have instant access. In the case of cloud, commercial cloud, we often don't have to deal with queues. We can uh, fire up as many computers as we want on demand. Um, we also democratize access 
uh, because people only need a web browser on their personal laptop to engage with these uh, larger computing resources. Downloading is avoided, which is often a bottleneck for scientific workflows these days. We have uh, scalable power and computing resources. We can plug in GPUs to our workflow if we need them. When we don't, we're not using them. And um, by packaging everything up to run on these different heterogeneous systems, so commercial cloud providers, where we tend to be improving the reproducibility of workflows because we're making data sets accessible over networks and we're also containerizing all the software that runs to analyze those data sets. So that's, that's the vision. Um, there we go. There are a lot of concerns around this vision. So I'm putting these points down here to kind of spur some discussion later in the day, I think. Uh, but we have an unfamiliar cost model in this case for many scientists. People aren't used to cloud-based infrastructure and there's a steep learning curve if setting up that infrastructure yourself. There's concern over commercial management of public data. Um, this is, these are things we've heard over the last year from scientists getting started in this project. <clears throat> And uh, there's potential vendor lock-in. So if you develop all this infrastructure that only runs on an AWS system, it's not very portable. But those advantages are really big. And I've taken a slide here from uh, Shell Gentman's uh, keynote from the ESIP meeting that just happened last week. There's a link to it here. It's recorded. So I highly recommend folks taking some time later in the day to look at uh, some of the recordings from the ESIP meeting, uh, which was really great. But the ultimate goal really with this rethinking of infrastructure is to reallocate time of scientists. So the traditional timeline at the top there is the 80% of figuring out where your data lives and doing all this work to organize it. And then very little time at the end of the day actually writing your paper. And we really feel that with this cloud-based approach, you can kind of flip those time allocations. Uh, the Computing architecture, again, we saw this uh, from Fernando, but our idea is to use Jupyter um, and to give people kind of curated Python libraries or sets of Python computing in environments that uh, facilitate distributed computing. And so there's been a large focus in the Pangeo project so far on Python in particular, using the libraries Dask and X-Array to work with these large climate model data sets or large cubes of uh, satellite imagery. Foundational to this architecture is uh, the storage of data um, in an appropriate format. So we've been advocating a lot for the czar format or cloud optimized geotiff, but you need uh, data sets to be stored in some sort of tiled fashion to facilitate distributed computing. Um, and then a lot of the work we've done so far has really been um, <clears throat> Uh, borrowing from Jupyter's kind of guidelines on just on setting up Jupyter Hub on a Kubernetes system for cloud providers. This allows us to run things on Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, um, different systems. I'm going to skip over this. These are just some of the libraries we typically highlight in presentations. Um, but for this community, I just want to draw attention to the fact that um, the the platform of Pangeo is really a collection of platforms that have been supported through cloud credits from cloud providers, Google, Amazon. These are Jupyter Hubs that people can simply log into with a GitHub username and immediately have access to the Dask configuration for distributed computing. So again, as Fernando mentioned, this would be the services component of what we're doing, which has been hugely important for getting people up to speed on using um, these software sets and this style of computing. So we have uh, Jupyter Hub running on AWS, Jupyter Hub running on um, Google. We also have uh, binders set up running on both of those systems. Um, and again, this is this is a binder that is attached to these Dask clusters to do distributed computing. The best way to get familiar with how this works is to go to this website, gallery.pangeo.io, and you can try out some interactive examples here. Um, there's a tutorial for getting started, and then there are more sophisticated workflows um, <clears throat> that increase in complexity. 
The one other thing I wanna to touch on in this presentation is the role of Hack Week. So at the University of Washington eScience Institute, we've been running week-long Hack Weeks over the past several years. Um, these are really important for supporting like community training, getting people up to speed on, on these Python tools. So Hack Weeks are a, really a, a welcoming environment designed to facilitate this building of a research community. And they're really intentional um, really well-designed projects to get people working on uh, developing software and contributing to open source projects while creating connections in their research community. So a typical Hack Week will include many uh, community building activities over the course of the week, uh, hands-on tutorials, and these hands-on tutorials are done using one of these Jupyter deployments that we've put together. Um, also project time to advance some sort of research project. And uh, just recently, we hosted the um, ISAT-2 Focus Hack Week, which is specific to a nice, uh, NASA satellite that recently launched as the first 100% virtual event. And we had 80, over 80 participants for this event. You'll see some familiar faces on the screenshot in the lower right here. Um, it was very successful and uh, important aspect of its success was having this centralized Jupyter Hub environment that participants from all over the world could log into and start sharing documents and working together. So um, I'll just point out that um, we've put a lot of effort over the last year into making uh, these, these fancy Jupyter Hubs deployable such that other research groups and people putting on Hack Weeks can do this themselves. Um, there's a schematic over here of what the website looked like when people logged into this environment and how JupyterHub partitions machines to different people when they log in. <clears throat> um, this slide I put in here because I, I just want to draw attention to the fact that um, part of the beauty of this project is that everything is kind of out in the open from the ground up. So there is a certain level of complexity in uh, deploying and then keeping track of these systems when you set them up, these services on cloud providers. But we've, we've been trying to kind of lay this out so that other groups can do it. And I'd love for people to, who are interested, who I suspect are on this call, to get involved in trying to deploy these systems um, yourself. So this is a nice blog post that Sebastian Alvis wrote, uh, one of the co eyes on the project at the University of Washington and setting up this infrastructure for the ISAT2 Hack Week. And I'll just end with a couple questions to kind of, uh, again, spur thoughts and discussions for later in the day. But um, just reflecting on the last year, we recently had to give a report to a, Na uh, a NASA technology infusion workshop. And we're asked, what's the biggest challenge of this project so far? Um, and I put two uh, things in response to that question about what's, what's the biggest. But one being availability of data, this whole motion to move things to the cloud or the data format is key and the availability of data on the cloud is key to the success of this. Um, and also this wariness over long-term costs, who supports these services when they're no longer supported by cloud credits. Um, how to overcome these challenges. We think these hack weeks are really key to um, getting the community accustomed to cloud computing. Um, but the long-term funding and support of these systems is a unsolved problem still. So thanks everyone. Those are my slides. Please check out those links in there um, in your spare time later today. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, uh, for that presentation. Um, I, we're, taking, we're having a, a few questions coming through, uh, through Slack, and we encourage all of you uh, to post your questions on Slack, and we'll have a, a brief uh, Q&A session um, right before the lightning talks. But uh, we'll continue with Kevin Paul from NCAR uh, next. Um, Scott, yeah, you thank you. Stop sharing. There you go. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I need to be made a co-host, I think. <laughs> you should be good to go now. Okay, thank you very much.
Okay. Where am I? There we go. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks to the uh, wonderful introduction by Fernando and uh, Scott. Uh, I think everybody is uh, fairly familiar uh, with what Pangeo is uh, and the fact that uh, Pangeo has had a lot of success being deployed in the cloud. Um, but uh, and it's also been mentioned that Pangeo can be deployed uh, on high performance computing systems, uh, such as NERSC and uh, our supercomputing system at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I work with my colleague Anderson von who will be speaking at one of the lightning talks a little bit later. Uh, Scott's already given a little bit of uh, introduction to this, but deploying on the cloud has a lot of advantages. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to uh, deploying Pangeo on the cloud, but uh, um, you can deploy it on HPC and there are obvious differences to uh, what that deployment looks like, stemming mostly from the fact that HPC has a number of limitations uh, that uh, don't necessarily exist in the cloud, um, such as limited access. Um, it's very difficult to just spin up a server, for example, on an HPC system and convince your sysadmins to make it public to the internet. Uh, HPC is usually bare metal, uh, so there's no virtualization, um, usually not even containerization, although that's changing. Uh, HPC limits uh, resource access. Um, uh, this is also, I guess, connected to the fact that it's bare metal, uh, but it means that the uh, standard user just doesn't have uh, sysadmin access, so you can't use things like Docker, which a lot of uh, the Pangeo cloud stack uh, is built on. Um, as a result, uh, since you're not going to be using Docker or Kubernetes or anything like that, um, HPC uses job schedulers, um, which many people are familiar with, such as PBS or LSF or Slurm. Uh, and that's sort of the common way of launching uh, large jobs and sharing resources for that. But the goal of Pangeo on HPC is exactly the same as it is for Pangeo on the cloud. Uh, and that's centered around this idea of a common user interface, um, which is Jupyter. Uh, that's built on this architecture involving Jupyter Hub, which spawns for you a Jupyter Lab, and then provide access to canonical software stack via custom kernels. Uh, and the goal, obviously, is to try to make the user experience the same. Uh, in fact, I think ideally we would say that the goal would be to try and make it so the user doesn't even know whether or not they're running on an HPC platform or if they're running in the cloud. Um, we're not quite there yet. Um, there are differences, um, usually having to do with uh, things like authentication. Uh, sometimes there are functionality differences. Some supercomputers uh, don't provide direct internet access through the compute nodes, for example, um, which can limit what you can do. Uh, there are also differences in the software stack um, by necessity. Um, for example, as was already pointed out in uh, one of Scott's slides, there's a difference between Dask Job Queue and Dask Kubernetes, which is just being able to launch your Dask cluster, um, which provides you your parallelism in an HPC environment versus in a Kubernetes-based cloud environment. But instead of going through just a bunch of uh, bullet points, I think it's uh, useful to try and do a demo. Um, I say try, I hope this works. Uh, I'm gonna take you to uh, NCAR's Jupyter Hub here. Um, we have a, a um, selector page, which allows you to select which of our systems you wanna run on, the Cheyenne supercomputer or our data analysis and visualization cluster. I'm going to do this on Cheyenne. There's obviously an authentication page because we can't just open the things up to the internet and this requires duo so there's a little bit of a delay here. And then as it usually works in HPC you have to select exactly what kind of resources do you want. This is actually becomes a job submitted to the PBS uh, scheduler. Uh, all I have to do is basically give it that. You'll notice that the rest of this 
is defaults to just asking for resources to run one process, which is all I need to run Jupyter Lab. And so now I've submitted a job to the queue and it takes a little bit to spawn it up uh, and start my Jupyter Lab session running. Usually it doesn't take very long. Uh, this is where everything could have fallen apart, but it didn't, yay. Um, so this is what you typically run into. This is the default, uh, in a lot of ways, this is very close to the default uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, uh, this is what you would, or some, something similar to what you would see if you just launched Jupyter Lab on your laptop. I've got a notebook here uh, that is a good demo of a fairly large data set, uh, and I'll show you that. You'll see I land in my home directory on the supercomputer. Uh, this is a, this example here is an example of a 100 member ensemble containing precipitation and temperature data. My thanks to Anderson Bonahirwe for giving this to me. Um, it has the usual boilerplate where you do some imports and there's a little bit of setup up front. So it takes a little bit, but then the next step here is creating and launching a Dask cluster. Um, now you remember, I just asked for resources for one node, uh, uh, one process, uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Dask job queue here to actually um, request from the PBS job scheduler resources to launch a bunch of Dask workers. Um, and that's what Dask job queue does for you. So I launch this and you can see I've requested 72 workers. There are 36 cores on each Cheyenne compute node. So basically I'm asking for two compute nodes and it takes a little bit for each one of those jobs to make it through the queue, but you can see I've done it. Uh, and I even get a link here to the uh, Dask um, dashboard. And we have this Dask lab extension uh, installed in here. So I can see things like um, the progress window, the Dask progress window, nothing's happening. So this is basically empty right now. And I can also take a look at things like memory use, and I can spread this out uh, like so, give myself a little bit more real estate so I can show you what I'm doing. And you can see, uh, you can even ask Desk Job Queue to tell you how it requested the workers through the PBS uh, job scheduler. And then I can connect a client to this and start looking at my data. So that didn't take too long to actually get to a point where I'm actually looking at real data. This is a czar store uh, that's held on NCAR's storage platform, Glade. Uh, it's about 1.7 terabytes. Um, you'll notice it didn't take very long to open it because all it was basically doing was reading metadata. You'll also notice that it's a czar format, um, which as Scott mentioned is ideal for cloud, but it also turned out to be really nice for HPC environments with a parallel file system as well. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm reading this into an X-Ray data set. Um, X-Ray uh, can print out information about the data set in an easy to read format like this. You can see it has precipitation variables and temperature mean temperature variables. It's got a 100 member ensemble uh, and it's got a lot of time steps. You can take a look at what the size of one of the, some information about one of those variables, for example, the mean temperature. And you can see that Dask has distributed this data across all of the workers. Uh, it's chunked it up uh, into chunks. Um, a one per ensemble member and 366 time steps per chunk. And now I can start using X-Array to do some actual computations. This is the computation that's subselecting a small amount of that 500. You'll notice up here, this is a five, half a terabyte basically for each one of these variables. I can subselect a particular time step uh, and do some computation on that. Obviously by subselecting a time step, the amount of data I'm using is actually much less, but uh, all the operations are lazy until I actually do something with it, like compute or uh, plot in this case. And what I can, I can actually do is I can actually tell Dask, and you can see the windows up here start working, uh, and 
I end up getting a plot of the standard deviation of the errors, uh, which is pretty reasonable. Uh, it didn't take very long. That's partly because we selected only one of the 13,500 uh, time steps. Uh, and we can do something more significant and use the entire data set where I'm actually going to take the temperature mean and do a mean across time and then compute the spread uh, across the ensemble members. So I should get back something that only depends upon latitude and longitude. Again, this is a lazy computation, so it's not doing anything yet until I actually tell it to. And now you can see over here uh, in the right as it starts to churn along in its computation, uh, you can actually start to see it uh, moving fairly quickly. Uh, it's doing a lot of czar reads. Uh, it's computing the mean in time. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but this is giving you an example of exactly how long it takes to process half a terabyte with 72 workers, um, two nodes of our supercomputing cluster. And just to give you an idea of exactly how much that's actually used of our supercomputing cluster and it's done, uh, that was, uh, there are 72 cores that I'm using and there are about 150,000 cores in the supercomputer. And now I can immediately get that data and plot it. That's all I'm gonna show. Uh, I'll go back to my talk now. Um, uh, we are not the only players in the game, obviously. There are a lot of HPC centers that are devoted to Jupiter. Um, this is a slide from colleagues at uh, NERSC, um, Shreyas Cholia and Roland Thomas, who've done some amazing work with Jupiter uh, on the NERSC systems. Uh, this central image here shows uh, essentially that chooser page that you saw at the very beginning of the demo uh, that in this case, it's particularly customized to each user after authentication, and it only allows you to choose things you actually have access to, which is pretty cool. Um, the top right of this slide is showing a uh, Jupyter NB viewer deployment that they have local to their own disks so that users on NERSC can, can uh, provide a static view, a statically rendered view of a notebook with colleagues, and then they can download that notebook uh, along with the environment that's needed to run it uh, into their own home space on NERSC. Uh, that's just a handful of things that uh, the NERSC folks have done. You can see down here a laundry list of amazing things that they've actually done. I'm actually quite jealous of all the things that they've done, and I'd like to get a lot of this stuff uh, implemented at NCAR as well. Um, what's next? Uh, there are obviously a couple of different um, things that we can't do on HPC yet that you can do in the cloud, such as Binder. Um, we are working on that. Uh, we're also hoping to kind of build up some data discovery um, capabilities using existing data search capabilities at NCAR uh, and link those in through an extension to the Jupyter Lab. Um, those are just a couple things to think about. Uh, thanks to Anderson for help with the demo. Thanks to the folks at NERSC and thanks to the NSF. And that's it. Thank you so much, Kevin, um, for that presentation and Anderson for the materials. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions and one of them is directed to you, Kevin. Um, so perhaps uh, if you could uh, briefly uh, show again, the I don't know if you still have it open, uh, the loading of data on X-Array. Uh, sort of how, if you could show that part of the notebook um, and kind of illustrate how X-Array loads the data. Sure, yeah, um, that is, uh, obviously I, I couldn't do a lot here. Um, I, I had very little time, but I, uh, I can show you, this is the notebook here where I have actually loaded the data, okay? So XR here is just X-Array uh, and it has a function uh, called OpenZAR. Uh, which allows me to open up uh, a czar data store. Um, and it's stored actually on my colleagues' scratch space on our Glade storage system. So this is a parallel file system, it's GPFS. Uh, it's obviously, as, a, as you can see here, it's about a 1.7 terabytes. Um, and just in the same way that czar works uh, in the cloud, 
uh, when you open up the data set, you're not actually reading any data uh, except for coordinate and metadata information, which doesn't take very long, um, which is why it took less than a second to actually open this. Uh, but X-Ray then gives you, loads this whole data set into something called an X-Ray data set, and then allows you to view information and metadata about each thing. So I can get information, for example, about T-Mean down here directly from this interface, which is a fantastic interface. Uh, I can get information about precipitation. Uh, this is telling you how it's been chunked by Dask behind the scenes, uh, so that when you actually do start reading, you're reading in parallel. Um, and that's it. Does that answer the question, or is it uh, everything after this was basically doing lazy computational or selection, subselection operations with uh, X-ray? Um, I hope that answers the question. Sure. And uh, there was a several people asked also whether this notebook could be made publicly available. Is is that is that something you could post on GitHub, or we can post it as part of the materials when we wrap up? I think so. Um, yeah, I, it's uh, it only works on because this store is only available sure. on uh, on Glade. You can only run it actually on Glade. But if you go up to the top of this, there is a version of this that is freely available on the cloud, and I can post that link uh, for everybody Excellent. via a binder. Thank you, Kevin. Um, another yeah. question that came up, I think, from more than one person was, and this might be something for, especially for Scott and, and Joe as well, um, where um, the, the type of resources that you showed could be cost prohibitive. And so is this something that is only accessible to universities and government entities? So if, if Scott and Joe have common takes on, 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 that, on that question. Yeah, I was just typing a quick response in the Slack channel. Um, I would say no. Um, it's definitely the cost scales with your number of users. Um, and one good aspect of the cloud deployments now after a year of iterating or so is the costs are actually quite minimal just as for a baseline infrastructure, but it depends on how many users you have because everything's dynamically scaling. So Joe, did you want to add anything to that? I, no, I think that's basically it. I think um, the nice thing about the cloud is you only pay for what you use. And so you can scale up your deployment to take care of a specific task or do a workshop or to do whatever computation you're using. And then you can scale it down. And so I think there's actually a pretty good counter argument for the fact that the cloud costs more, which is um, you, you don't pay for idle time on your machines. Yeah, I would second, um, perhaps that's a third. Uh, the, uh, this, the whole platform uh, is fairly uh, easy to deploy and yeah, the other costs definitely do scale uh, on, on cloud. Uh, the biggest, uh, I think, cost for small groups would be storing data in the cloud. Uh, um, but I would say, or I should, maybe that's not the biggest, but it's a chunk. Uh, and I would say that there are efforts by institutions that actually own a lot of the data, such as NCAR um, uh, and NASA, uh, that are, are actually hosting the data in the cloud themselves. So getting access to that data and using it in the cloud is usually very, very low cost, if not free. Uh, so um, I would say that aspect of the costs is uh, something that hopefully we're uh, we're not going to um, not going to incur to most of our users. Um, Ryan says he has a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, Please, Ryan. You know, I just wanted to mention um, a very sort of um, uh, low key announcement, but we we recently received uh, some notice that we'll be getting some new EarthCube funding to provide data hosting for the EarthCube community. So in terms of who will pay for the cost of hosting data, I'm happy to be able to say that going forward, um, we have a sort of strategy 
to, to provide that to the community. And our, our funding includes the, the hosting costs. And it also includes working with alternative storage providers like Wasabi Cloud and Open Storage Network that can provide cloud style storage at a bit lower price point than say Amazon. Excellent news uh, and congratulations on the, on the funding. That actually dovetails with another question that perhaps you can comment on, which is whether NASA has any plans to make data available in certain formats and, and as part of these arrangements. Um, yes, me. Uh, any of you in, who are well plugged into kind of the Pangeo and uh, kind of NASA data availability. That's uh, one for Scott and Joe, probably. Yeah, so, so NASA's kind of in a multi-year transition over to hosting some data sets on AWS, and there is no single storage format that's been identified as the go-to format. Um, but everything's on the table right now. So um, HDF, ZAR, uh, GeoTIFF are definitely some formats you'll be seeing NASA data sets in. Thank you. And this one perhaps back for uh, uh, um, Kevin and others uh, close, closer to the HPC side than the cloud side, uh, whether chunk size is important on HPC when using ZAR. And, and perhaps if you can comment on how the chunking decisions are made. Anderson, do you want to field that one? Sure. Um, so I, I think in this particular case, uh, the original data set was actually in SDF format and the way that I created the chunking, I was just looking into what I was going to do with the data. So I would say that it actually matters. Um, but um, that in itself may cause a few problems. Like if at, at a later time you actually want to do some uh, other uh, operation that maybe kind of deal with dimensions that have been actually chunked and you don't want actually them to be chunked. Uh, but there's a new package uh, from the Pangeo project called Rechunker. Uh, I think Ryan, can actually uh, speak to that. Uh, I just know that it's basically meant to uh, address these issues where nowadays you actually have to spend so much time thinking about how you're gonna chunk your data, uh, but that in itself is not really a guarantee that things are gonna work smoothly because at some point you may actually have to rechunk it. And the whole uh, process of rechunking is, it can, can be quite ex expensive depending on what you're trying to do. But the rechunker project is trying to address that. Uh, I don't know if Ryan has a comment on that because uh, I'm not quite familiar with uh, exactly what the rechunk is actually doing. Well, I mean, I'll just say that, yeah, this is something that's fundamental to large multi-dimensional array analysis. There's not really any way around it um, as long as there's some correspondence to reading data you know, physical proximity on disk um, and, and its impact on read performance. So we've always had chunk data in one form or another, whether it was spread over many NetCDF files or, or whatever. Using ZAR kind of makes that totally explicit, um, which is probably good for thinking about your workflow. But it's definitely the case that some workflows will be optimized to certain chunk structures and some will fail hard on the same chunk structure. So um, rather than trying to say that there's one universal chunking scheme, we've moved towards the view that um, you should have the ability to um, rapidly uh, uh, kind of and temporarily rechunk your data into a format, into a scheme that fits your analysis best. And the rechunker package is a tool that tries to implement that. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, and in order to keep on schedule, perhaps Anderson can pick up, uh, pick up the mic again uh, and uh, take us into the lightning talk section where uh, you'll open, Anderson will open up with a talk on intake. All right, give me a second. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Okay, good. Uh, let me know, uh, should I start or should I wait? Go for it. Okay, good. All right, uh, give me a second. Okay, so, okay. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Anderson Van Hier. I work as a software engineer at NCAR. Uh, and today I'm just going to talk about Intake and Intake ESM. Uh, so I realize I only have five minutes, so I don't really have any slides prepared. I'll actually show you a live demo 
of what those two tools do. Um, so Intake uh, um, is a Python uh, data uh, cataloging and data discovery tool. Um, and Intake ESM is a plugin, is an Intake plugin uh, designed specifically for Earth system model outputs. Um, and it's now actually switch gears and actually look at the demo. Um, so what I have here, so I basically have a notebook where I have two use case. And the first use case uh, is about the sea surface, sea surface temperature uh, data that is actually provided by NOAA. So if you actually look at where this data come from, at least where it's actually hosted on this uh, NOAA website, the way it's basically structured, you basically have a bunch of directories uh, by year and month. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a lot of directories and it goes all the way back to 1981. And if you actually want to get like a specific file, you basically have to go to a specific directory and then you have to pick whatever file you want to get. Uh, and work, so in most cases, you may actually have to download the data. You can't just access the data. Uh, but Intake actually allows us to, to bypass uh, a few of the pain points. One of them is we can actually basically define a catalog. In this case, I basically have this YAML file where I'm um, basically defining like a few things. Uh, so I have like these parameters here. Uh, so I know that, okay, in this case, uh, I could actually change that to 81. Um, so I know the time range for the data. Um, and I basically have this argument here, which is the path, uh, which as you can see, it's basically like a pattern of what, of how the data is actually structured on the server. And what I'm basically saying is, um, take whatever parameter the user provide and then fill those in here and then retrieve the data. So in this case, I'm actually using this new feature in SCDF. You can now uh, basically request uh, an SCDF over HTTP directly. So this is basically what this is actually doing because I didn't actually want to go through the opened up um, server. Um, and uh, one more thing. So I'm also telling Intake to actually cache the data on the first access locally um, since the request may actually be expensive. And basically once I'm done with that, I can basically say, okay, give me the data that correspond to this year, this month and this day. And then what I get back is basically an XRA data set. Um, so this is not really fun. So what we can actually do, we can actually tell Intake, yes, Intake to basically retrieve a bunch of those. So in this case, I'm basically defining like a range. This is actually like, a, like an entire year. Uh, and I'm basically using Dask to basically retrieve a bunch of those files uh, uh, in parallel and also caching them as well. And what I get is basically, again, a single X-ray data set. And once you have that data set, you can basically just do some interesting stuff. So you can just go on and actually do some um, interactive visualization. You can build uh, dashboards with this because as you can see, the only thing that you really have to provide is just these parameters. So this is something that you can easily turn into a, a dashboard. Um, so that's enough about Intake. Um, now let's actually talk about Intake ESM. So, so Intake doesn't really um, force you to have your catalog as, as a YAML file. You can basically define your own catalog format and then you can actually uh, build uh, a plugin on top of Intake, which is what we did for Earth system model outputs because these, they tend to be huge. So basically a YAML is not really the right way to do it. Um, and also the hierarchy and how things are actually structured. Uh, in this case, the use case is gonna be uh, the CMIP, uh, which as most, most of you probably know, it's basically like an international uh, effort like from all these different countries and different institutions. Um, and an NCAR will basically have uh, a subset of that data. Um, so in this case, I have my catalog as a JSON file. And in the JSON, what I basically have, I have a pointer to a CSV file, which in the CSV, I basically have a table where in, in the table, each row corresponds to every single NCDF file and the metadata associated with that NCDF file. Um, and what, when I basically read it, what I get is basically um, a data frame. So I read my CSV into a data frame. Uh, and as you can see, basically I have close to 1.7 million items here. And then within Intake ESM, then I can actually now start actually querying that catalog. So in this case, I'm saying, 
give me this variable. Um, I'm only interested in this particular experiment ID or this particular uh, time frequency um, and for a bunch of other stuff here. What I get back is basically the same object as the original object, but then it only has a subset of the data. And then once I, I'm satisfied with uh, that request, I can now basically tell Intake ESM to load the data into X-Array objects, which what I get basically here is basically a dictionary of data sets. Um, and that dictionary of data sets um, basically has, uh, so we basically take the 78 files and we actually group them into compatible groups. Um, so we only end up with only six X-ray data sets, even though we actually had 78 nested files. Uh, and then once we have that, we can basically just do regular science. So in this case, I'm basically just computing the mean across time um, for all the data sets that I was able to retrieve. As you can see, there's some activity going on here with Dask. Um, and then once I'm done computing the means, I can basically just do the plotting. So basically after this step where you actually tell Intake ESM to load the data, Intake ESM just gets out of the way. Um, so after cell number two, uh, cell 12, you should basically just do the regular stuff that you do with uh, uh, X-Array and Dask. Uh, and uh, with that, let me see if the plots actually show up uh, in a second. Um, uh, hopefully it shows up soon, but yeah. So yeah, so basically this is what I got. Uh, so, and as you can see, I was able to do that with as, I mean, the amount of code that I have to write here is really uh, small. Um, and as you can also see throughout this notebook, there's, you don't see any path or any URL, which this also kind of uh, uh, helps with uh, distributability and things like that. Like you can easily share this. And if let's say someone was actually working in the cloud, they can actually point Intake ESM to some catalog that actually points to data in the cloud and they'll basically just run exactly the same code. Um, and with that, I'll basically uh, hand it to, to the next speaker. Hopefully I didn't go over five minutes. Thank you, Anderson. That was that was lovely, and I really I really enjoyed the demonstration of the Dask cluster um, on on the right, kind of watching the activity as the computation was running. Um, next, we have um, Scott uh, Dale Peckham from CU Boulder, uh, who will be talking about widgets and interactive interfaces. So, Scott, please go ahead, and um, you have the floor. Can you see my screen? Yes, we okay. can, and we can hear you as well. Thank you. Okay, okay great. So um, I'm going to give a just a short talk about a um, Jupyter notebook that has that uses IPy widgets and IPy leaflet to create interactive uh, GUI and map for people to select data sets. And the the project this is part of here is this logo. Um, it's an EarthCube project called Balto, which is an acronym for Brokered Alignment of Long Tail Observations. We thought it was cute. Uh, since Balto is the name of a famous sled dog from Iditarod uh, fame, we thought it was cute to put him in because he has a long tail also. But um, put that aside. So these are my, I, my uh, co-PIs on the Balto project listed at the top of this. And there's a little table of contents in this notebook. This is on my GitHub um, repository, which uh, I think there's a place to find that later. But if I scroll down to where the action is here, um, there's code behind this that I've written for both the GUI and for some plotting. And I'm using primarily four packages. Uh, one's IPy widgets for the widgets. One's IPy leaflet for interactive maps in the, in the notebook. Another one is PyDAP for accessing a, a server that has the OpenDAP protocol that supports that protocol to access some data. Another one is matplotlib for the graphics. And so if I run this, this little section here, it starts up a tabbed GUI. Ho hopefully you can see that okay. Um, it's got five tabs. It's, the first one is to browse some data. So we've got a default uh, OpenDAP URL in here. And I'll hit the go button. And it goes out and it searches that URL and gets this list of all the files that it finds there, which is this is a test server that uh, the OpenDAP people use where they have lots of variety of data sets. And so you can 
you can go and first choose a data set, and I'll choose this one called uh, SST monthly mean .nc.gz. And then it will, based on what it finds inside that file, it will give me a list of the variables that are possible as a, in a drop list here. So I'll go down to SST and everything will update to show me the units are degrees C, the dimensions are time lat lawn. Here's the shape of that array, um, which is, you know, it's kind of big in time, not very big in space. And uh, two byte signed integer. So all the information it finds on this it puts here and then any attributes such with this variable, which would normally be part of an SCDF file, are put in a drop list for, for quick reference to be able to look at. And if I had chosen a different file up here, it would be different variables and different attributes uh, populating these lists. So now that I've chosen the sea surface temperature monthly means data set, um, I don't want to download the whole thing. I want to subset it. So I'm going to go to spatial extent. And because I happen to be in Puerto Rico right now, at my house in, in Luquillo, uh, I'm going to just zoom into that, but I keep activating my dictionary for some reason. So I'm going to zoom in. And this is using um, IPy leaflet now for this interactive map. And at the bottom here, I've implemented some of the different uh, maps that are part of that. So I can just toggle between S3 World Street Map or OpenStreetMap.MapNIC or many others, but I'll stick with this one. And there's also a, some tools you can optionally include in your uh, IPy uh, leaflet window besides the zoom, which is this full screen option, which is kind of cool. And then you can go back to when you're done looking at things to the smaller view. But now I'm going to zoom out just a bit to get more of the ocean around Puerto Rico. And the, the research question is, okay, has surf, how has sea surface temperature been changing over the last hundred years around Puerto Rico in the, in the waters of the Caribbean? So now I'll go to the, uh, the date range. And this data set goes back to 1854, but I'll show a smaller portion of it. So I'll change this to 1908 to get a nice hundred years. And then I go to the download data and hit download. And it's really fast because it has already subsetted the data by space and time on the server before downloading it. And so instead of downloading that large data set, I just download the little part that I need for this, this thing. And if I scroll down through these instructions, I have a few things I can print out about the data set that are loaded into the Balto GUI object, uh, looking for no data values, looking for things like that. But then uh, in the interest of time, I'll just jump down to the plot here, where now I'm using Balto plot, which is another set of routines based on matplotlib that I've written. And I'll plot up the sea surface temperatures within the region, with one of the corner pixels of the region that I just selected. And sure enough, there seems to be a, a trend towards greater uh, temperature over time, over the last hundred years. And these, these wiggles are, are the annual cycle, or you might think that they're in annual cycle because this was monthly data. So to confirm that, we'll plot a subset of that. And sure enough, there's about 12 dots or plus signs per uh, oscillation here. So that's the 12 months of the year before it goes to the next cycle. So that's the basic idea. It just shows how kind of a cool way to uh, blend together or glue together uh, IPy leaflet, IPy widgets, PyDAP, and Matplotlib to create a, uh, a tool that could be easily modified. Like if you wanted to modify this to do something else, to go to some other type of server or, or do something else, you can, uh, you can look at the code in, in Balto GUI.py and see how the panels are set up and see how the events are processed and, and you know, just go from there. It's all, it's all open source. And that's, that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Scott. I really enjoyed your presentation at the previous EarthCube meeting, so I'm glad you were able to join us. Much appreciated. No and problem. Continue being in contact about these things. Um, so Thanks. next we have um, um, Ed Almarj from, uh, uh, from UC Berkeley who will be uh, talking about applications in hydrology. So, Adam, you have the floor. Yeah, okay. Let me share the screen. I do you see my screen and 
hear me talk. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak the hydrological use case of the Panjo project. And I am Adam, uh, a postdoc at UC Berkeley, working on hydrological models and their uncertainty. Uh, in talking about the hydrological Panjo use case, I'm going to start with three brief motivational statements. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in hydrological data processing, particularly in case of uh, intensively monitored wet ships. So the good news is uh, funding for highly instrumented wet shed for long-term hydrological data collection has been a priority. And this funding comes from SF and other state and federal agencies. So there is a concerted effort to monitor um, wet sheds, wet shed data to support hydrological models and hydrological understanding. Um, here is a map of two of the major networks of hydrological data observation, uh, particularly intensively monitored um, wet sheds. The red one represents the critical zone observatory data set, and the green one represents the long term hydrological data collection with ships and some other data sources from public uh, universities and national libraries. So, within each watershed, there is uh, many subsets of watershed within. Each single CCO or liter watershed will have multiple watershed where data has been collected. And within each sub watershed, there are stations uh, that will collect numerous hydrological and chirurgical uh, variables with these sensors. And usually, these sensors collect data at hourly and sub hourly. Uh, frequencies. So, um, this, uh, maps and this web share creates a good opportunity for developing generalizable hierarchical principles and behaviors about these web shares, and we can develop some theories or generalizing principles based on this data. But the reality is, such principles do not yet exist in hierarchy. And then to the bad news, we don't have a uh, synthetic understanding that emerged from this data that will support um, hydrological process understanding or models. And then to come to the other side, uh, these data are generated from this uh, web shared networks that data being generated do not have common standards and they do not have common time stuffs and they do not have, they do have very big gaps or different gaps and they are really difficult to access. So this is the ugly part of the data collection from these intensively monitored web shares. In short, the data collected from this uh, web shares is unorganized and not, re not ready to use to model development or hydrogen color And then to the solution, what we are proposing and working on is a Pangeo use case for performing common hydrological downloading and processing tasks. So we intend to develop a Jupyter-based um, data processing scheme that will acquire the data and make the data ready to use from this intensively monitored researchers. The data processing scheme we employed includes uh, primarily four standard stages, so four standardizing stages. The first stage being data downloading and acquiring from these different sources and websites. And then the second stage is where we do quality control and cleaning, where we look out and clean and find off uh, outliers as well as um, unrealistic values since we are collecting raw data. And the second phase is 
I mean, the surface is data aggregation where we aggregate the sub hourly and hourly data into a daily time scale. And the final fourth stage is where we do data processing, where we fill missing values. And in filling up the missing values, we employ uh, three stages. Primarily, the first one being basic interpolation, where we fill um, short short uh, lengths missing values, primarily less than a week or less than a day in our data sets. And then we go to regression to fill the missing values. And in regression, we do have two types of regression. One is the regression, the first phase where we go different uh, stations. And the second is the climate catalog method or the climate catalog regression approach where we borrow and regress time in data in time. So these are the data processing schemes we employ in very interactive manner in, in Jupyter Notebook. And the end result from this is from this uses a very organized data from 30 web strips across the US, the one I showed you earlier. Um, and the data contains discharge, precipitation, uh, snow, sweet, soil moisture, soil temperature, and isotope data from these sweatshirts. And we do have so far sweatshirts, and the data record length ranges from five years or two years data for, for some variables and 20 years data for some of the remaining variables. And the data format for releasing, this is an HCF format, uh, and it will be hosted in the Pineville Cloud. And going forward, we are hoping to expand to multiple web shapes, hopefully across the US in more places and going out of the US and covering uh, the lot. That's our plan going forward. So that will be an open interactive platform anywhere any researcher can contribute to this uh, open reproducible data products and they can use our Jupyter tool to clean and produce this data to a standard format as an unorganized role game. So with that, I will conclude my lesson. Thank you so much, Adam, for that presentation. Um, we'll move on to Eric Sandell, uh, who's joining us from Sweden, uh, talking about Jupyter book. Eric, um, please go ahead. I don't know that we're hearing you, Eric. Oh, no audio. We can see your screen, but I can't hear any audio. Fernando, do you want to move to the next one and we can yes. loop back? Why don't we flip on to Georgiana while you test your audio, uh, Eric, if that's okay with you, since we're a little bit tight on time. Um, Georgiana, would you uh, mind hopping on um, to the Jupyter Hub presentation and we'll try to debug with Eric um, separately? Sure. Let me Thank share my screen. So you can share your screen and we can hear you, Georgiana. Yay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for invi inviting me here. So, I'm uh, Georgiana Dolokan and I'm currently working as a Jupyter Hub and Binder contributor in residence. And today's presentation will be about, um, we'll cover some basics about Jupyter Hub and the quick demo. So um, when you first hear the word Jupyter, the first thing that pops into mind is probably the notebook with all the, be the, the beautiful visuals, the code and the text. Um, but then when you say Jupyter Hub, it might be a bit confusing at first to know the difference between the two. I mean, for me, it was at first. So um, this presentation will, will try to explain a bit um, these differences. So let's say uh, we have a user that has a Jupyter notebook and then um, this user has some, uh, some team members that they too want to use the Jupyter notebook um, to be able to um, uh, work on the same data set or just sh uh, share the, the compute environment. 
And uh, for this, we have the Jupyter Hub. And Jupyter Hub is made out of three main components, which is the authenticator to like make sure that just the right person accesses the hub, the spawner um, that creates uh, each user uh, each user's notebook, and then we have the proxy to know how to route each user to their um, their own um, Jupyter notebook server. Um, and all of these components are configurable. Um, you can choose from um, some that are available from the community. So for the authenticator, you can have the palm, the palm authenticator, the native one. You can log in with GitHub, um, Google, Bitbucket, and others. The same for spawner. You can have uh, some options. You have some options there. And for the proxy, there are only two right now: the uh, configurable HTTP proxy and the traffic proxy. And all of these are available under the uh, classic notebook interface or as Jupyter Lab. And um, to make the um, Jupyter Hub deployment easier, um, we have like two superhero-like projects: uh, the Little Jupyter Hub and Zero to Jupyter Hub. And um, the first one, the Little Jupyter Hub, as the name says, it's um, mostly suited for uh, small groups of people because um, you have just one server and you have um, the users and the hub running on, uh, on just that server. This can be a bare metal one or just in the cloud. And for Zero to Jupyter Hub, we have multiple servers, again, in the cloud, and all of these operates under Kubernetes laws. So that's super cool. <laughs> And for the demo, um, I want to uh, show uh, how easy uh, the Little Jupyter Hub deployment is. And this is pre-recorded because it takes more than five minutes to <laughs> actually install it. So this is uh, deploying um, the Little Jupyter Hub on DigitalOcean. This, uh, everything here is in the documentation. Uh, so um, right here, I'm just, choosing the data center. And then in the user data, you just have to copy from the documentation, just a small comment to run, and then everything gets installed. And here you just set the, uh, the admin, the first admin that will be able, able to access um, the hub the first time. Okay, so we are not enabling, enabling backups because this is just a demo. <laughs> uh, so while the droplet um, builds, uh, after this, this, you'll have an IP address there. Um, when you first access the IP address, you will get a 404 because, and this means that the Little Jupyter Hub um, wasn't yet installed, but you can always SSH into that server and see um, the logs there, um, if something went wrong, and you can actually see when, um, when that was ready. So here I'm just showing how the, the, log, the logs look like. So we just see all the steps here. And then uh, when everything is done, you'll actually see a message with that. <laughs> and um, afterwards, you just copy the IP address and then paste it in a browser and you have the Jupyter Hub login. Again, logging in with the first admin I just set. Uh, the little Jupyter Hub uses first use authenticator. And this means that the, the, the password you set when you first log in, that will be the password associated with your account. You can always change the authenticator afterwards. Um, okay, so uh, as an admin, you can always um, add more users um, from the admin interface. You can add uh, just regular users or other admin users. And um, these admin users will have um, will have the will have the uh, the rights to uh, install different packages because all the admin uh, users under Jupyter Hub under the little Jupyter Hub are um, also pseudo users. So this is just accessing the terminal from a from an admin account, and uh, here I'm just installing uh, the NumPy package. You just have to use the minus C option to make sure that it gets installed into the right uh, environment, which is the user environment. Okay, so once we have this installed, um, you just like open a Python notebook and you can import the package and hopefully there'll be no errors. <laughs> In my demo, there, were, there weren't so. <laughs> so that's basically it. <laughs> the little Jupyter Hub is very easy to install. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you liked it.
Georgiana, thank you so much for that lovely presentation. And I'm very impressed that you were able to do this off of a, an actively running video. Um, that's very good timing. Uh, much appreciated. <laughs> Um, Eric, it seems like your audio is now back on, so we'll move on quickly to you in the interest of keeping time and leaving at, at least a little bit of time for the wind, uh, for the Q&A. Thank you. This uh, lightning talk is about JupyterBook. JupyterBook is a tool that allows you to create beautiful websites from notebooks and markdown files. And since we use them so often, this is a tool that can come very useful. So, JupyterBook does something like this. It takes a collection of content in the form of notebooks and markdown files, and it converts it into uh, a book. A book can be a website, or it can be a PDF file, and other things. But we'll focus on creating websites. So, you, you have a collection of content, you create a website from it, and JupyterBook it's the tool that does it for you. So getting started on using JupyterBook is something like this. It's a terminal tool, so first you need to install it. To install it, you use the Python package manager called pip. So pip install JupyterBook, and you're done. To have a book, you can get a starting point with some boilerplate files. So you run the create command here. If you run the create command, you get these files, the folder and some files in it. Let's look at the files. First, you have a configuration file. This is where you set the title of the book and various other settings. Then you have table of contents. This is where you define the structure of the book. So what if you have multiple notebooks, in what order should you view them on the websites, for example? And then, of course, oh, those files here, the configuration file and the table of content, it says in the file format YML, it's for YAML. And YAML is something that is very useful to learn. It's like JSON, but it's more human readable. So if you spend time learning this, it's something you won't regret. In the folder, you also get some um, demonstrative content. So markdown files and notebook, which becomes content for the website. Now, you have just provided content so far. You have not get, got any HTML or something like that. This is what the build command does. And by default, you get HTML, a website. Running this build command gives you output in a build directory. The build directory will, for example, have an index.html. And this is a file you can open up on your local computer. Then it will look something like this in your browser. This is the standard what you get out of the box Jupyter book published as a website. Uh, but yes, it's on your computer right now. Of course, you would like to publish this online in the end. So, for doing that, it's useful to have some Git and GitHub knowledge, but the documentation for JupyterBook is so great that you, don't, you can get by without having any previous experience, I think. The documentation is available at jupyterbook.org. And to the left, you can see here, get started. You go for the overview, building your book and publishing it online. And I have had such a great experience of publishing books online using GitHub pages and GitHub actions. This is something, this is an example of a web address that you can get if you publish your book online with GitHub pages, which is free. And GitHub actions is a tooling that allows for any change you do in the Git repository to automatically build and update your book online. So when you have set this up according to the documentation, you don't have to use the tool JupyterBook anymore because it's done automatically for you. And that is really good because it's enabled one very useful feature. You can go to the configuration file and point to 
where your book is on GitHub. And if you do, you can get such a button here on your website. And this button allows any users visiting your website to, to find their way to the GitHub repository where the book is defined and say, oh, you have a spelling error here. Or I suggest that you rephrase this uh, part of the book like this. And if you accept the change, suddenly it's updated. Okay, so now writing the book, it, you want something more than just a set of contents. You want to cross-reference, etc. So you have some features. For example, perhaps you want to hide code, code blocks of your notebooks and just so, show graphs or certain sections. You can use uh, metadata inside of the notebook and in this case, a hide code metadata tag to hide code. And while you write these books, I said you can do it using Markdown and notebooks, but the Markdown is a bit extended with the label called MIST. And MIST provides two additional parts to Markdown, roles and directives. These are like functions for Markdown. To the left, we see an example of how, for example, to, to cite uh, a reference. So if you define a reference, you can cite it and you get it nice formatting. Directives are bigger functions, so to say. You can do something like inserting a figure. As an example, here is how to insert a note, which renders like this on your website. So this is the markdown in mist flavor. And here is the result from having such markdown. One of the most important things of Jupyter Book, I think, is this ability. If you have a set of notebooks, you want perhaps to have a one very big notebook that you just want to generate a figure from. And then you want to use that figure somewhere. This is what you can do like this. You can use the glue function to save an object from a notebook and then you can insert it into Markdown somewhere else in your book. And over here, it's a directive as we just have seen. Okay, that's about it. Jupyter Book can help you publish a website and the documentation is just so good that I believe everybody can do this. It doesn't take five hours, it takes 30 minutes or one hour. And Jupyter Book is created as part of the Executable Book project. And here are the team members of Executable Books. And it has a rich community and we are all welcome to join. I am one of the person <laughs> happy to, to join this community of contributors. And uh, with that said, please go ahead and visit jupyterbook.org to learn more. And uh, if you want to have these slides, you can find them here. I'm Consideration on GitHub and Chris Holgraf is in this meeting and is one of the co-founders of Jupyter Book. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, much appreciated. And uh, we will close the lightning talk section with uh, Joe from uh, Pangeo, whom we've already referenced a few times. So Joe, you have the floor. All right, I'm just pulling up my screen here. Great. I think you should be able to see things now. Audio and video, all good. Great. Thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Hammond, and um, uh, Lindsay and Fernando asked me to just kind of wrap things up with a uh, short lightning talk on how uh, to connect with the Pangeo project. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, just briefly, um, I'll just say who I am. My contact information is here. I'm a scientist at NCAR, and, um, and I also work at the, a new nonprofit called Carbon Plan. Um, and I've been working on the Pangeo project for uh, about three, three or four years now. Um, and I also contribute to a bunch of open source projects. So uh, just remembering back to Scott's talk an hour ago or so, um, Pangeo is first and foremost a community of people working collaboratively, and I just want to highlight a few of the places that uh, those interactions are had and where you might find Pangeo people around doing their thing. So 
Um, the first is uh, on online, so almost all of the interactions and um, events that uh, Pangeo uh, coordinates or is part, or is part of um, happen online. So GitHub is kind of the primary central uh, place where you'll find things. So github.com slash Pangeo data. We've got a chat room in, on Gitter um, and that's for kind of short, quick messages and coordination things. Uh, we have a discourse forum um, where you can find uh, and post questions about how to do things or um, we, we coordinate uh, regular meetings and whatnot there. And of course, there's a, there's a Twitter account as well. Um, uh, highlight a few of the kinds of, uh, of meetings um, that we have on a regular basis. So on Tuesday and Thursday mornings right now, we've been doing the, what we call the COVID-19 coffee breaks. Um, these are open to anyone. There's no agenda. It's just like an opportunity to see another human. Um, we talk about Pangeo, obviously, but you know, baking or baseball, whatever you want to talk about, that's, that's there. So um, just thought I'd mention that really quick. There's a weekly uh, developer meeting. Um, it's kind of a mix of scientists and software developers. Um, it's on Wednesdays, the timing alternates. I didn't put it on the slide um, between an early time and a late time for different uh, time zones. Um, and we do a lot of coordinating on kind of ongoing development in the open source uh, scientific Python world. This is just a screen grab from a few weeks ago. Um, and it's a good way to keep up with kind of what's at what the present day uh, activities are um, on the Pangeo project. I spend most of my time on this slide. Uh, this is, uh, we, we, we have this kind of uh, thing that on the surface looks a little uh, bureaucratic, but we have these things called technical or topical working groups. And it's not meant to be bureaucratic at all. It's meant to provide a space where uh, we can have more topical discussions, go a little deeper. Um, so right now we have four of these working groups. Um, there's a uh, data working group um, that does things like, uh, that talks about things like data formats, schemas, best practices, and, and performance. So if things like, you know, talking about NetCDF versus ZAR versus TileDB versus Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF are in your wheelhouse, um, this, is a, this is a good working group. Did we lose Joe? I think we might have. Hmm. Let's give him a few seconds, but it's 9.10 in our agenda, but it's actually 9.45 in the real world. <laughs> and so we don't have a huge amount of slack. We have negative 35 minutes of slack right now. Um, so unless Joe's internet returns happily within a few seconds, we may need to wrap up. Um, we will post, uh, uh, folks, um, links to all the slides. Okay, Joe actually dropped out, so his computer may have crashed. Um, Lindsay, we were wrapping up, and I think you were going to uh, run the, what we have left of time with the Q&A session, so I might just hand it off to you. Um, and, and unfortunately, we may have had to cut Joe's talk short. Uh, sure. Uh, no problem. We'll hopefully get uh, Joe's slides, but at least they get uh, a bit of a flavor of some of the places um, where you can interact with the Pangeo community. And as a part of the Q&A session, we'll also be inviting folks uh, to engage on discourse uh, to answer some big picture questions that we have posed and that we were hoping to speak to, um, but we probably won't have the time to get into in depth. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here. Right. And can folks still see that? Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is actually invite a couple people who have posed some questions either before the session or um, during the session uh, to ask their questions. So I'm going to start off um, by inviting Phil Austin uh, to jump in with his uh, question and um, sort of call for some community input. Sure. I've, uh... Can people hear me? Yes. All right. So um, just a little bit of background. I'm um, at the University of British Columbia, where I chair the atmospheric science program uh, in a department that's sort of broadly earth science. So we've 
got about 50 faculty. We have about 350 graduate students. And I think we actually are kind of typical for university infrastructure in that um, we have a ton of pretty capable $3,000 desk side Linux machines that, uh, you know, you just occur uh, into budget grants where you have to buy something to lock in your, um, your budget uh, before it disappears, that kind of thing. And so I, I believe that there's a missing middle, I'd call it, between uh, Zero to Jupiter Hub, which does great. I mean, it's, it's for bringing up a meeting to teach, it's perfect. Um, but you leave little, uh, the littlest Jupiter Hub and then you hit Zero to Jupiter Hub and it's not a learning curve, it's really a learning wall. I mean, uh, you need uh, pitons to get up uh, Kubernetes, I would say, just giving you my personal experience. And so um, what I'm volunteering to do is, is just share my own journey, which is to provide this intermediate stage where you can use these desktop machines or uh, bare metal like little, little Jupyter Hub, but you've got a pathway that involves Docker. And then just one other thing I think for outreach and training, uh, trying to figure out where graduate students are going, uh, experience with Docker and uh, you know, how to actually manage the cloud is something a graduate student probably uh, needs and I think having a graduate student's practice on something that's free as opposed to practice of something you pay for uh, is just a huge win. Thanks, Phil. Um, does anyone else want to chime in or have follow-up thoughts on, on Phil's comments here? I'll jump in there really quickly. Phil, having deployed these things both at single systems and at cloud scale, I, I agree that there's a middle ground um, and, and you, you sort of already mentioned sort of Docker Things like Docker Swarm are just such nice, easy, easy infrastructure to install on a number of, of managed machines. So if there was a model of installing the Jupyter Hub to that kind of infrastructure, I agree. There'd be a lot of use for that. Yeah, just to borrow something I wrote on this uh, Jupyter Book ticket, there's nothing more eloquent than a working example and being able to just do Docker Compose up and have something actually work where you can also SSH in and figure out where the Jupyter Hub config is stored and all that kind of stuff, play around with a reverse proxy for those of us who are using that for the first time. And then look at these, look at these um, ways of spawning notebooks uh, for a certain type of person and a certain type of graduate student. Uh, it's, it's just really important to be able to get in and watch the pieces actually move. And so to continue conversation, I know you posted on the Pangeo discourse. Is that the best place for if folks are interested in, in conversing with you on this? Would that be the best place to get started? Uh, sure. I, I visit that pretty frequently. And then also uh, they'll, I'll, uh, there's also this Pangeo outreach, right? Poets, which has been pretty quiescent, but I think I'll try and bootstrap uh, something there. And I'll just start posting my own sort of... Um, I'll, I'll, for, in, for anything I learn, I'll actually, I'll actually put an executable book together and I will have the executable book itself will be a Docker Compose GitHub repo. So you'll be able to run my executable books with a Jupyter Hub and a web server and we'll just see how that goes. Excellent, thanks Phil. Um, next up we have a question from Lisa. Uh, Lisa, are you online? I think so, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, so as I said here, I'm a PhD student in the energy resources group at Berkeley and a master's student in the computer science department here as well. Um, but before this, I worked at an environmental consulting firm um, and did a lot of data analysis and data work with CMIP5. So the CMIP6 has seemed really interesting to me and I still contract for that company. So I'm basically predicting I'm going to have to give some pitch to them in the next year or two about how we're going to work with CMIP6 because we have nowhere near the resources um, to do that locally. We were pretty pushed to the limit even with CMIP5. Um, so I was sort of curious. I think we're mostly academics and government people, but was sort of interested in like the infrastructure permissions, costs for working with some of this um, potential CMIP6 infrastructure from a private company setting. Just curious if people have done it or thought about what that might look like. Joe, is this something that you would have experience with if you're back?
he might not actually be on the call. <laughs> he probably would if he was back. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think Joe is not back. I don't see him at all on the, on the list. Um, so he may have had a, an internet mishap. Uh, Scott did he... post some helpful links though um, on Slack, I think. Yeah. Scott, yeah, go for it. Oh, um, yeah, the links are on Slack replying to Lisa's question, but um, for sure private companies have been setting up the same infrastructure we've shown today for the cloud deployments. Um, I think it comes down to whether or not you have personnel to dig into the details as Philip yeah. mentioned, it's a bit of a learning curve. And so there are companies now as well that are starting to provide these services for, you know, a, with a fee um, catering towards specifically companies rather than like educational government academic groups. And so that if, if you're going the, if you're doing work for a company, I would possibly re recommend looking at some of those. Um, yeah, start some of those startups. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think overall, just this stuff, I mean, as a speaking from a graduate student perspective, I think the comment before this was really relevant and this, the CMIP 6 and other stuff is really relevant. So it's exciting to see as a student. Well, thanks, Scott and Lisa. It looks like uh, Joe has just rejoined us. Sorry, we lost you there. Um, but we did actually get a question that is quite relevant to your talk asking about uh, if the working groups are um, open to the public. Yes, uh, somehow Zoom totally hard crashed on me and I'm back now. So, uh, and the answer is yes, they're all open to anyone. So the website that I had up there, pangeo.io slash meeting notes has information about joining um, any of the uh, five or six regular, regularly scheduled meetings that we have for the working groups. What I can do here, Joe, is I'll stop screen sharing if you'd like to, um share share those slides if you still have them up or if there's any other uh comments you wanted to to get in before before we lost you um yeah i don't know if i still have them oh i do have them up still so um uh i'm not a host anymore though so i think it's okay i was on this my second to last slide it's um it's not a big deal so. okay no worries. Um, were there any other questions uh, for Joe on engaging with the community, joining in on working groups? Um, anything anyone would like to bring up there? I also wonder if Joe had any comments on Lisa's questions because he's worked, I know he's worked with Google on making the CMAP6 data sets uh, available through, at least through Google Cloud. And I don't know if that intersects in any way with Lisa's concerns on access to those data and, and their usage. Oh, the, uh, Joe, the question that's on the screen right now. Yeah. Um, so there's actually some kind of movement there. There's actually going to be a, a mirror of this data also on AWS. So we're kind of seeing the data um, proliferate a bit, um, at least between Google and, and Amazon. Um, and it's they're in public uh, public uh, data buckets. So there's no egress charges for using them outside of the cloud, but you'll um, find that the performance of using them in the in the same region, cloud region would be the best. So, um, you know, I think uh, to the there's there's no there's no nothing that limits you to using uh, that limits us to just having this be kind of government and academic. Anybody and actually there are a few companies out there that are using these these data resources from the cloud, um, just just like the Pangeo, like they have kind of their own private version of Pangeo running. Um, and accessing these data. So it should, should be no problem um, if you cool. can sort out how to pay for it. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, were there any other questions that folks wanted to bring up? Pause for a moment. I'm curious about the, the size of data that you would typically use, work with because if you work with CMIP6, CMIP6, CMIP6 is so big that you don't work with the whole data set at once. But how big chunks do you typically work with in your workflows? Lisa, do you have oh, a... Oh, that's for me. Sorry, I was about to say, is that for oh, me? Um, 
Yeah, so I think I think CMIP six will probably be an interesting um, like new challenge for that question. With CMIP five, we were probably at largest working with. I mean, we were storing maybe uh, six or seven terabytes on disk. Um, we're working with the Loca downscaled CMIP five product. Um, so I was a sixteenth of a degree. Um, and I think we used 14 GCMs. Um, so yeah, somewhere around there. So, so sort of, as you mentioned, the challenge hasn't been, although the, the speed with actual, it's like, there's two challenges, right? There's the storage challenge that we were facing because we're sort of pushing the envelope on the data processing of the company. And then there's also the processing side of things. And both of them have started to become bottlenecks for my work. You know, the things that I'm asked to do are not particularly complicated. Like I can do them, but the company resources are just bottlenecking both the processing and the storage. Um, so it kind of depends on what the client wants. Um, I think CMIP 6 will be a new challenge because everything is not really an option anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, I know we're, we're coming up in the hour. So what I would like to do is show, there's a couple of questions that we've prepared um, for the community that I think would be interesting uh, to really collect some community knowledge on and see what we can do um, to potentially build upon ideas. And so what I've done is we've posted these on discourse. Um, so I'll read them out now um, and we can we can think on these and hopefully continue some of the discussion on um, on discourse actually so Eric and I assemble these together so um, perhaps I will let Eric uh, uh, read through this one and we can alternate here so what does your interactive computing workflow look like today and what do you envision it will be in five years so we hope to get input on uh, your visions on how to improve the workflow and uh, understand better how, how your workflow looks today. Uh, the next question we have relates a lot back to Eric's talk. Um, how would you like to publish and share your computational research? And where can improvements, current, where can improvements be made? Um, so thinking sort of again of both about this, how is your current workflow implemented and what would you envision it and what ideally would it look like for you? And how do you stay up to date with the evolving open source ecosystem? In other words, how do you learn about the new tools that you may want to use? And how would you like to learn and how would you like to keep up to date on these tools? It's a lot of tools. How do you learn about them? Um, and then too, if there's other ideas for community projects, I think um, Phil prompted some nice questions of, of, you know, what can we be doing sort of in between um, the littlest Jupiter hub and Jupiter uh, zero to Jupiter hub. But there's certainly other ideas out there. Um, and so feel free to, to post your questions and uh, we can look at, you know, finding uh, getting in touch with the right communities to take action on those. Um, so we posted and Eric posted the link in Slack. Uh, we've got the discourse post that we've created uh, for this session. And so we posed those questions there. So we would invite you to contribute your ideas. Um, what we would like to do is we'll be writing up a short blog that's a bit of a summary of, of this meeting. Um, and we also would really like to include ideas uh, that folks have posted and, and posed um, and so we'll, we'll work on synthesizing uh, what you share with us. Um, and so with that, um, we just want to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been certainly an interesting and enlightening session. I really appreciated all of the, the speakers who took time to prepare material um, and uh, invested their time and effort in, in sharing their knowledge with all of us. Uh, so big shout out. Uh, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. And thanks for everyone for spending time with us today. Uh, we hope it has been uh, a useful session for you and we look forward to your input. Um, Fernando, I don't know if there's anything else you would like to, to close with. Usual, you're muted on Zoom. Uh, I echo I echo your, your thanks to all the speakers.
our team, to the EarthCube team as well, who hosted us and provided coordination and support on, on Slack. We very much appreciate it. Um, and we will post as soon as the, the recording of this meeting is ready. Uh, we will uh, post it online on, on Discourse as well. Um, and uh, all of the slides and materials from the presentations that we have are also available. And so we will, we will post that. Uh, we will post that, uh, those links uh, both on Discourse and on Slack. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll uh, try to wrap up now so that people can go on to their 10 a.m. meetings, which I'm sure everyone has their next Zoom meeting to jump into. So I'll stop the recording now. Um, thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure, and we hope it was useful for, for folks. Uh, I'll stop recording.